Great, I think we're ready to get started. Mike, you wanna kick us off? Okay, here we go. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for a discussion on reigning in monopoly power and strengthening antitrust laws that protect small businesses. My name is Mike Tucker. I'm the executive director of the Independent Office Products and Furniture Dealers Association. This is a topic that is near and dear to the heart of myself and all members of our association. Uh, the office products industry in the mid 80s boasted nearly 12,000 dealers. That number today is less than 1,500. Corporate giants like Office Depot and Staples use their market power and unfair business practices to crush their smaller competitors. Today, we're looking at a similar scenario. Amazon and other tech giants have developed dominant e-commerce platforms and are using their extensive anti-competitive conduct to crush smaller competitors across multiple industries. Small businesses, whole industries, and communities they support are disappearing at an alarming rate. Antitrust laws are not new. They've been on the book for decades, but in recent years, they've been seldom enforced. Today, I'm happy to report that we have members of Congress and the Judiciary Committee that are working very hard to change that. It's now my pleasure to introduce the co-director of ILSR, Stacy Mitchell. Stacy has been leading this charge to protect local and small businesses for over a decade. She's written articles, done research for numerous national publications, testified before Congress and the FTC, and frequently presents to industry associations like ours. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Stacy Mitchell. Thank you, Mike. And hello, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to have you all here. We've had an incredible response to this event. More than 400 people registered, about 70% of them uh, own or work at an independent small business. Really great to have you all here. We're here today because in the 1980s, the federal government began to relax the laws that had previously kept large corporations from amassing outsized power and using it to bully competitors and monopolize markets. Since that time, we've seen extreme levels of consolidation across most industries. And today, working people, small businesses, and communities are all suffering as a result. In many sectors, unchecked monopoly power is the leading threat to the viability and future of independent businesses. And some of the worst effects are being felt among black and brown entrepreneurs and communities. The good news is that there is a growing movement afoot to reinvigorate our anti-monopoly laws. And we're gonna to hear today from Representative David Cicilline, one of the key leaders driving this issue in Congress. More than anything, I hope that what you'll come away with from today's event is a sense of the momentum on this issue. We have um, a real opportunity right now and it won't last forever. And I'm really hoping that you all will join with us in seizing this moment and standing up for change. We'll post a link in the chat uh, right now and throughout the event where you can let us know if you wanna stay informed and get involved. Um, so a few quick housekeeping things before we get going. Uh, first, I wanna thank the 17 small business organizations that co-sponsored this webinar with us and have really made this issue a top priority for their uh, organizations. Second, let me give you a quick overview of the format. Um, we're going to begin with our keynote, Congressman Cicilline, who will offer remarks and then take a few questions. We invited a few of the people who had submitted questions when they registered to ask their question live. Um, we'll also be taking written questions throughout the event, and you can submit those using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you submit a question, please identify yourself, let us know your name, business, and location. After we conclude with the Congressman, we'll move to a second panel featuring one of the leading advocates for antitrust reform, law professor Zephyr Teachout, uh, along with me. Um, and then we'll wrap things up with Dana Ennis of Stay Local in New Orleans, who's gonna tee up some important next steps coming out of today's panel, and you won't wanna miss that part. Uh, finally, if you're a member of the press, please stay on at the close of this event. Several of the small business leaders and owners uh, will be available to take your questions uh, for a few minutes after the event closes. 
And with that, let me introduce our first moderator, uh, Dan Cullen, who is Chief Strategy Officer at the American Booksellers Association, a 120 year old organization uh, that represents the nation's independent bookstores. Thanks, Dan, over to you. Stacey, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I couldn't be more honored to be able to introduce Congressman David Cicilline. Do the Congressman has served as the representative in the US House for Rhode Island's first congressional district for the past decade. In addition, and very importantly for today, he's a national leader on antitrust and he serves as chair of the House, small, of the House Antitrust Subcommittee, which has um, recently uh, produced an amazing report. Um, Congressman, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're really grateful here. Um, you know, as, as large mega corporations continue to become increasingly dominant in the marketplace, in the economy, in really every facet of our lives, it, this has become, uh, antitrust enforcement in the 21st century has become incredibly important for, for our association's members, independent bookstores. In fact, though, for every Main Street business, and I know that's been such a focus of your work on the Hill. Thank you very much uh, for that nice introduction, Dan. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. I, of course, want to thank the Institute for Self-Reliance and the 17 small business organizations who are co-sponsoring this webinar and uh, particularly grateful that you've invited me to participate in this really important conversation. Um, and, you know, uh, we all recognize, I, I, I know, that locally owned and independent businesses are really the lifeblood of our economy and I think particularly central to our economic recovery uh, from this pandemic. And so the role that you play as independent small businesses is really um, critical to local communities, critical to our economy and, and very central to our recovery. Uh, I want to begin by thanking and recognizing the incredible work of Stacy Mitchell and the Institute uh, for Self-Reliance for um, not only your great advocacy and all of your great work, but for your active participation in our subcommittee's uh, digital markets investigation in the last Congress. And your contribution was invaluable in your organization. So thank you so much for that. Uh, as was mentioned, I chair the House uh, Judiciary Committee's Antitrust Subcommittee. And in that capacity, I was very proud to lead a 16 month uh, top to bottom review of the digital marketplace. Uh, and the committee's bipartisan investigation focused on the four dominant platforms, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. Uh, this was a really uh, thorough investigation, the first of its kind in uh, more than 50 years in the Congress of the United States. And as part of this very careful investigation, uh, subcommittee staff reviewed millions of pages of evidence, including the emails and communications of the CEOs and senior executives of the dominant uh, technology platforms. We held seven really robust hearings, including one this past summer where we directly, directly questioned the CEOs of Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple about their power and the conduct of their companies. And we received submissions from 60 leading antitrust experts, uh, folks like Zephyr Teachout and others. Uh, and we spoke with more than 240 market participants that rely uh, or, or that either rely on or interact with these dominant technology platforms. And the last point here is really particularly important. We would not find ourselves where we are today on the cusp of real change without the hundreds of local and independent businesses who helped raise awareness about the dangers of unchecked monopoly power and the urgent need for action. So I really wanna express my deep gratitude to the many small businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators who shared some harrowing stories about their experiences. Uh, I saw firsthand how your individual and collective stories helped uh, my colleagues, my fellow members of Congress, and frankly, the American people understand why this fight against monopoly power uh, is so important and why uh, our fight broadly against monopolies matters so much. Uh, as an example, at our CEO hearing, Jeff Bezos was confronted with the words and voice of one small business owner who shared her horrific experience as a third party seller whose business was haphazardly destroyed by Amazon without notice or cause and what that meant in, in her life. 
At the end of our investigation, we were able to present concrete evidence that Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple all possess and abuse their tremendous market power. Uh, and among the members of the House Antitrust Subcommittee, there is now widespread agreement by Democrats and Republicans on the facts and the need for congressional action. And that's no small achievement in the kind of partisan times in which we live. So that would not have happened without the participation of so many of you. Uh, last week, we announced that the subcommittee will hold a series of hearings to consider legislative proposals that will address the rise and abuse of market power online. We will hold our first hearing this Thursday at 10 o'clock to examine the proposals to address gatekeeper power and lower barriers to entry online. It's going to be a great hearing and uh, we're obviously beginning to develop really good uh, legislation. As part of this process, I will of course work closely with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to develop uh, a series of effective solutions that will address the competition problems that we've identified during the course of the investigation and really uh, follow the recommendations set forth in the report. This is, I think, as Stacy said, a really important and consequential moment, I think, to develop and advance legislation that will rein in monopoly power, invigorate small business, protect jobs, and promote innovation online. And I think the momentum uh, that we're seeing is a result of really an awakening about the very serious consequences to our economy, to innovation, uh, to entrepreneurship uh, as a result of the kind of market dominance that these platforms uh, re represent. And this really is a moment and we intend in Congress to seize this moment, working with all of you to make sure we move forward and make significant progress to address this monopoly challenge we face in our country because our failure to do so is not an option. The consequences of failing to act will continue to be very bad for the economy, for our democracy, uh, for job creation, for innovation, and for all the things that are central to a prosperous economy. So thank you for including me in today's conversation. I, of course, look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you, Congressman. You know, your hearings were um, must-see TV at ABA, um, and uh, but I know there are members and, and small businesses are, across the nation are anxious to become participants in any way that can be helpful as well. So to, to hear from you today and kind of outline, you know, where we are and where we can go is really, really helpful. Um, now we have some questions for the congressman from small business owners. Um, and before we start, just a reminder, everyone, you can also submit your questions right now in the Q&A function as well. So Congressman, I, I think we're gonna hear from uh, first uh, Natasha Amont uh, of Whisk. She's uh, of Whisk, which is a kitchen store. She's a kitchen store owner and it's in New York City. Great. Great. Thank you, Dan. And hello, Congressman. Thank you so much for your efforts. Um, as Dan said, my name is Natasha Amont and I'm the owner of Whisk, which is an 11 employee strong kitchen store based in Brooklyn, New York. Congressman, I want to ask you more about Amazon's predatory pricing tactics, which it has used, of course, to take over one product category after another. Reining in predatory pricing is critical to ensuring that small businesses can compete, but we should also recognize that predatory pricing puts downward pressure on the wages that store owners can pay to our employees. So currently, the courts see predatory pricing only through the lens of the consumer and fails to understand that being a consumer is actually secondary to people's need to earn a decent living. So two linked questions. One, do you think this consumer focus needs to change? And then two, how do we get the courts to prosecute predatory pricing? Yeah, I mean, this is a very critical issue and was a very important part of our investigation. And you've outlined some of the consequences of, really dangerous consequences of predatory pricing. and not only on wages, but on the ability of small businesses to survive. And you know, part of that, I think, has been a narrowing of antitrust enforcement by the courts, um, most of it kind of out of whole cloth. Uh, and I think one of the things that you see in our report is a set of recommendations really to reassert the kind of real uh, purpose of pro-competition policy and to not uh, and to respond to 
a set of court decisions that have narrowed that significantly by reversing those directly. And uh, I, you will see legislation to do just that. Uh, and But I think you point out a second issue, and that is we have to ensure that our agencies not only have statutory and regulatory frameworks that allow them to successfully prosecute and enforce a good antitrust policy and good pro-competition policy, um, but we have to be sure that if they are staffed with and resourced uh, sufficiently so that they have people who are sufficiently enthusiastic and creative about good competition policy and that they then have the resources to litigate and enforce these policies. And, you know, I think there has been, I think, a recognition that the resources have not been sufficient. We haven't had the right kind of leadership necessarily that understands the urgency of uh, this challenge. And I think a new administration presents us with a real opportunity to be sure that we have leadership in key places that will aggressively enforce antitrust and be creative uh, and expansive in the way that they do so, but also that they have this you know, statutory framework and the resources to do it. Thank you, Congressman. Co Congressman, our next question uh, comes from Zakia Alekwa and her business is Cooking for Change. It's a food producer in Dorchester, Mass. Good afternoon, Congressman and everyone else. Um, uh, wow, I'm so happy to, to see that you come from, New, from uh, Rhode Island, my regional neighbor, right? Exactly. Listen, my business and a lot of other local businesses, we're working really hard here to care for the community during the pandemic. We're trying to grow our businesses and provide high quality local food and good jobs. But it's really hard to do that when we are being squeezed by these big behemoths such as Amazon. I see their vans everywhere and I know how badly they treat their drivers. What are you doing to make sure Congress sees these issues of part, as part of what's needed to help communities recover? We're talking about the community um, um, development opportunities as well from the pandemic. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So thank you for what you do and thank you for being a, an entrepreneur and an innovator. Um, and I think, you know, what we've seen, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, is that the market power of these large technology platforms has only grown during COVID. So they have become even more powerful and even bigger uh, and more nefarious monopolies in many ways. Uh, and so, you know, the purpose of the investigation was to really be sure that we understood and that, frankly, the policymakers responsible for good uh, antitrust enforcement and good pro-competition policy understood this marketplace. It's a sophisticated marketplace. It's a rapidly changing marketplace. But we wanted to be sure that everyone understood the gravity of the problem. And that's why we went through the effort of this very intensive 16-month investigation so that we'd have a record of really how the market operates, that, that we would understand completely the behavior, the anti-competitive behavior they were engaged in that favors their own products and services, that engage in predatory pricing, that reduce the, you know, that result in reduction in innovation and job creation and all the things you described. And so I think it created a framework for us to build consensus. And I think the good news is there is now consensus that I'm not sure existed before the investigation began. I think there was a lot of skepticism. People sort of looked at these companies and thought, oh, these are great American companies. They're great innovators. You know, they're creating jobs. Isn't this terrific? And I think as a result of that attitude, we didn't fully appreciate as a as a as a country really and certainly as policymakers the dangers that the kind of market power that they were accumulating would present and what the long term implications of that would be and you know we have a long way to catch up before we make this right and get these markets to work right i think the good news is we have a set of recommendations that will really bring competition into the digital marketplace that will prohibit the kind of self-preferencing and anti-competitive behavior that you're describing that will give small businesses a fighting chance to compete. They're outlined in the report and you're, you'll are you see us now move forward on legislation to do just that. But you and people like you have been a key part of the story because frankly, when we had our field hearing in Colorado and many of my colleagues heard small businesses describe how they had been treated by these platforms and what it meant to their ability to survive and prosper as businesses, 
I think it was really a turning point in the investigation. And so small businesses and innovators are a key part of the reason that we're going to have real success in finally doing something about it. Thank you, Congressman. Um, Congressman, our next uh, small business owner is Danny Kane. Danny owns Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas. Thanks, Dan and Representative Cicilline. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing. And thank you to ILSR for hosting today. Uh, the Raven Bookstore is in Lawrence, Kansas. We have 11 employees. And my question is, Amazon's market dominance and predatory prices are squeezing independent bookstores like mine out of existence. The subcommittee's report made a number of recommendations, including strengthening antitrust laws, but also recommended breaking up some of the big tech companies to encourage competition. How will breaking up Amazon enable businesses like mine to compete? And what could that breaking up look like in practice? Well, I mean, I think a number of things. I mean, there, I think one of the most interesting ideas that was developed during the course of the investigation for consideration is this whole notion of separating out the kind of we refer to it as the glass seagull of the internet the idea of of inherent in being a seller of goods and services and someone who controls the marketplace is an inherent conflict because you control the way consumers interface with products you have a your own private label your own um, products that are actually competing with people who are selling in your marketplace you're in this very opaque way collecting data that then is informing product development and what, how you sell things. And, and because it's unclear to people how products are put in favorable positions like a buy box, it creates real unfairness and a real conflict. So, I mean, one idea which I'm very uh, excited about um, is this notion of like, you can do one of two things. You can either be a seller of goods and services or you can control the marketplace that sells goods and services, but you can't do both because it's so fraught with conflicts and so much opportunity for anti-competitive behavior and self-preferencing and all the things which are bad for consumers, bad for small business, bad for competition, bad for innovators. So that's, I think, one of the bold ideas that we developed. I think you know, you'll absolutely see that in a legislative proposal. Um, but I think also some of it is we have to explicitly prohibit some, some behaviors because you know, simply breaking up companies that, that you then have 10 people doing really bad stuff that one person was doing, well, that might be good in terms of competition because you hope one of them will say, I'm gonna behave in a different way and become a more attractive platform because people value these three things, which I now provide. So there is a competition-based idea so long as you have portability and interoperability so people can actually move from one platform to another. But I think there's some behavior also that we need to be prepared to just prohibit outright uh, so that it doesn't matter how many competitors we have, they can't engage in that kind of behavior. And I think that's the, the responsibility we're going to have is to sort that out. Um, but you're right. I mean, it is making it impossible for small um, competitors like yours to compete with a, with a monopoly like Amazon. And they should have never been permitted to get as large as they have. And we have a responsibility to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. And now um, we have a we have a question, Congressman, from Gina Schaefer, and she is the owner of a few cool hardware stores in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gina Schaefer, and I own 13 Ace Hardware stores in Washington, D.C. I have 250 employees, um, and I am really appreciate being able to participate in this topic. So I took time away from my business today uh, to just ask a question. Um, as an independent business, competition feels, uh, I call it a death by a thousand cuts. You know, Amazon is infinitely more financially stable, stronger, and they receive a lot of preferential treatment from government just here in the local DC region, billions of dollars in subsidies to relocate their headquarters to the suburbs of, of Washington. Um, so they have resources that ensure that they can be top of mind uh, to the consumer as well. So I guess my question is this, how can we win the policy changes you're proposing or that we've called for when they have, when Amazon in particular has such strong uh, political influence and reach? Thank it's you. a great question. Uh, thank you for your uh, business leadership. Um, look, it's not a surprise that, you know, with enormous economic power, it is often accompanied by tremendous political power. And that's a, 
one of the great challenges we face. Uh, and that's one of the dangers of monopolies, one of the reasons that concentrated economic power is so pernicious and so inconsistent with democracy is this idea of um, having this oversized influence in our political system. And what we need to do is continue to elect people who are serious about this fight and continue to make it politically impossible not to respond in the right way on behalf of innovators and small business owners and entrepreneurs and stand up to monopolies. You know, we have examples throughout our history of great champions that have led the fight against monopolies. And this is not a new fight. Uh, they, they come in new forms. The monopolist names are, you know, Zuckerberg and Bezos and, uh, you know, uh, Pichai and others, you know, they have different names, but this is a this is a long problem. This is a battle that has existed for almost since the founding of our country. And I think it's our responsibility, those of us in government, those of us in the private sector, uh, those of us in the advocacy community, folks like you know, Stacy and her organization, to just make it clear that we, that we must address these issues and the failure to do so presents real dangers to our democracy, to our economy, to the ability of people to find and sustain work and and that it you know we simply i mean there are reasons that we have had a basic understanding that monopolies are bad and we have to remind people about the the reason that monopolies are so harmful and just make it politically unacceptable for people not to be on the right side of small businesses and consumers and workers in this fight and I think, you know, one of the things when we developed the democratic agenda for the people, this notion of taking on concentrated economic power as a way to get the economy working again for real people, for, for our women, was central to our agenda. And it's going to be central to our work. Um, but we have to make it politically indefensible uh, not to be in this fight against monopolies and uh, be sure that people are asking their elected officials uh, what role they're playing to make sure we fix this problem. But don't feel like, look, this is an uphill battle, but this is a battle we are going to win because we're on the right side and it's central to our, um, you know, kind of economic recovery and the economic prosperity of our country. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Gina. Um, Congressman, I have a written question as well. Um, and the question comes from Jimmy Wright. Uh, Jimmy owns Wright's Market, a grocery store in Opelika, Alabama. And Jimmy writes, we have 35 employees and have been around since 1973. Our store has been working hard to meet the demand of our, com of our community during COVID-19 and to keep everyone safe. Uh, we have survived in business by being involved in our local community and giving our customers the best value for their dollar. This is much harder to do today because the big box stores and the dollar chains are getting special packaging and promotional pricing with, from suppliers. We are not offered some package sizes that you find at dollar stores and club stores. The big chains also get that promotional pricing every day. We only have access to those prices and discounts every eight to 12 weeks. Is the problem of packaging and pricing discrimination something that your investigation looked at? Yes, I mean, I think it's a direct result of the absence of real competition. And uh, it is something I know that a number of my colleagues on the subcommittee uh, are looking at. And um, I will take your question as a reminder that we need to really continue to focus on that issue. And Congressman, um, here's a question from one of our participants in the Q&A. And uh, I apologize because I'm going to have to use my bifocals to read and I'll probably get too close to the screen. Um, here's the next question. Ellen Shepard asks, how can we galvanize public support for antitrust when people are so hooked on what they perceive to be convenience? Yeah, I mean, I think I saw, I see that as a continuing responsibility for those of us leading this work, uh, both in the, on the government side and in the advocacy world and in business leadership. Um, and we understood that responsibility in our in launching our investigation and the report that we wrote and in the hearings that we conduct to constantly remind people why this matters. 
Um, and I, I think the good news is there is um, some good polling data that shows that people actually understand that something is broken in our economy and something is harmful as a result of the monopoly power of these large technology platforms. And although they may not be familiar with all the terminology of antitrust and monopoly, they have a sense, they know from their experiences that you know, they're seeing retail operations close and malls close and they're seeing you know, um, jobs leave and they're seeing um, you know, it more difficult for innovators to be successful. And so I think there's a growing understanding, but part of our responsibility in doing this work is to constantly remind people about why this matters in the lives of working families in this country and that it's not some sort of just uh, kind of interesting academic discussion, but it has a direct impact on the daily lives of the American people in the wages they earn and the jobs that are available and their access uh, to other economic opportunities, uh, in the power that they have in the marketplace, um, in their choices. So this is an ongoing responsibility. It's not going to happen overnight, but frankly, as a result of the work that Stacey Mitchell and others are doing, um, I think we're making tremendous progress in reminding people or teaching people about why all this stuff matters. Um, and I think once people understand the implications of the monopoly power that these platforms have, they're immediately called to action. Congressman, thank you. Here's another question from Clifford Rickner. He says, I publish community newspapers. Are you considering anything like what Australia is proposing for the big platforms to pay for the content that we pay to create and they monetize without compensating us? Um, so we, I actually have introduced a piece of legislation in the last Congress and we will reintroduce it in this Congress to address this issue very directly that it, as an interim step would allow small online publishers uh, and producers of content to kind of band together for purposes of leveling the playing field so that they, the big large platforms would be required to negotiate with them uh, in good faith. Right now, they essentially dictate the terms to the producers of content in a way that allows them to basically take their content and take the revenue that they generate as a result of people having an interest in reading it. And it's a it's a model which is producing a tremendous decline in local journalism and the shuttering of newspapers and online publishers almost every day. The reason, you know, this is one of the first bills I introduced in this space was the reason is that this is critical because this isn't just like about, you know, kind of the sale of widgets. This is about our access to reliable, trustworthy local news, which is absolutely essential to our functioning of our democracy. You think about what local news does in terms of holding power to account, exposing corruption, making sure people have accurate and reliable information to make voting decisions. So this is central to our democracy. And to the extent we're losing local news sources and local newspapers, we are really endangering the survival of our democracy. So um, we have a proposal that uh, I think preceded the Australian action, um, but something I hope will move forward in this Congress. Thank you, Congressman, thank you. Um, Congressman uh, Ben uh, Ramali from Global Communication Competition Review is asking about um, the legislation introduced by Senator Klobuchar. Um, and Ben writes, when can we expect to see legislation introduced in the House? Uh, soon. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, we're being very um, intentional about this. Uh, I'm working with my colleagues on the subcommittee who participated actively in the investigation to be sure that we're developing legislation that can move both in the House, but also that has uh, prospects of success in the Senate. So, um, you know, we, anyway, I, I, I don't want to be critical of any approach, but we're being very intentional and my staff is working very closely with a number of uh, advocacy organizations and great leaders in this space and experts to be sure that we get this legislation exactly right. But we will be introducing legislation very soon on a whole range of these topics. Congressman, thank you. Um, 
we, we have another question. And this question is from Stara, Stara, Sarah Stefanik. And Sarah writes, what role has government at all levels played in letting these companies like Amazon and Apple grow to become monopolies? What are well, all levels of government doing to end this blind support of a bigger is better mindset? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I and I apologize, Dan, I probably have to run after this question. Um, you know, I, I can't be, I, I, I can't speak with uh, great familiarity what has happened at the local and state levels. Um, I can say at the federal level, I think, you know, the federal government has done very little. Uh, and I think, as I said a little bit earlier, I think this was partly as a result of, you know, these were new companies that were providing innovative services, as you mentioned, you know, these great conveniences of products coming to your house the next day, being able to talk to your grandchildren halfway across the country on Facebook. And so there was a lot of excitement about these new opportunities that were being presented. And they were American companies. There was a lot of pride. And I think there was this notion by people in the federal government, you know, frankly, from both political parties of like, hands off, you know, just let them flourish. This is an exciting time and they're growing, creating jobs and creating all this kind of new technology. And I think there was not enough regard or attention paid to what were the kind of long-term implications of this growing market power? And what did it mean long-term to a whole set of issues in terms of consumer privacy and competition and you know, entrepreneurship and capital formation and all these other, you know, consequences that had traditionally uh, informed, you know, antitrust enforcement. And I think we just allowed them to basically run the show with free of any regulations, any oversight. And I think they developed a sense of arrogance that they were going to kind of do whatever they wanted. And in fact, we know now that they do whatever they want and they have engaged in a set of behaviors which have been very disturbing, you know, great in terms of their growth and their, you know, increasing their market power and their dominance, but not good for anybody else. And so, you know, we, as a direct result of our inaction, I think we've, we allowed this to happen. And so we have a responsibility uh, to act quickly and smartly and effectively to respond to this. But um, I think they were, you know, essentially for decades allowed to do pretty much whatever they wanted to do, free from any government action. And I would say that, you know, one of the things we have to resist is there is some kind of grumbling sometimes about like, oh, you know, people are against success and people are against um, big companies. And, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. No one's against success. We just want the marketplace to work so we can make space for the other great companies so that you can make space for new entrants into this market and give you know, innovation a real opportunity to flourish so that we can all benefit from it rather than having innovation crushed because you have these four large technology platforms that make it almost impossible to enter the marketplace and compete successfully. So we want great companies to survive and flourish but we can only do that with a marketplace that's functioning, that has real competition. Congressman, well said, thank you. Um, and Congressman, the chat has been flying by on my screen at about 100 miles an hour, which I think is a real-time barometer of just how engaged small businesses are in this issue. And um, I know I speak for them when I just say again, thank you for everything that you and your, your colleagues on the Hill have done. Um, how, importantly, you noted at the beginning, it's a bipartisan issue. Um, and, and I think that's in large measure to, to the work that you've done to keep it that way and to help engender that spirit of, of commonality. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you made the time for us today. Great. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And I... Am I on still? Great, okay, thank you, I see nods. Um, we're gonna move into the next session, the next part of, of our program, but we wanna also hear from our participants. So please, here on your screen, you should see a poll. If you take a moment to fill out the poll about how your business has been impacted or how it's been challenged by consolidated market power and monopolies, um, just take a minute now and uh, let's all vote.
we're almost done with the voting. And through the miracle of ILSR, we'll have our results very soon. And here are the results. 57 of you responded that Amazon's dominance has impeded my ability to compete online. Uh, I should have started with 72% of you say, large corporations have more power to shape government laws and, require, and regulations. 51% said my big competitors receive better pricing and terms from suppliers. 55% said the antitrust agencies don't seem to care about abusive and unfair tactics by big corporations. 40% said mergers in my industry are, are creating an unequal uh, playing field. And 36% said I have to accept Visa and MasterCards no matter how high the fees. Well, that's a pretty telling poll. Um, and, and I know certainly for independent bookstores, uh, there would not be uh, any difference in the results. So I'm now um, gonna hand it off uh, to uh, Derek Peebles. Um, Derek is the executive director of the American Independent Business Alliance, Amoeba, which does fantastic work nationwide. Um, Derek, it's all yours. Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you for running a great conversation with uh, with the congressman. Uh, that, was, that was very good. Um, welcome, everyone. And for the next several minutes, we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, before we get into that, you know, I just want to be able to highlight uh, the independent business alliance leaders. Uh, many of them that are on this call. They've really been on the forefront of demonstrating and publicizing the importance that small businesses really have on our economy uh, in the sense of creating sustainable jobs and, and, and also encouraging consumers to be able to spend their dollars locally so those dollars circulate uh, around the community. Uh, something that's not really highlighted enough is that the local leaders and the independent business owners, they really play a critical role in establishing and strengthening community identities uh, across the country, which is very important and why we care so much about uh, enforcing antitrust efforts because these are the type of things that really kind of keep the dollars circulating and allowing business owners to be uh, um, really community leaders and, and set the identities for their neighborhoods. And so um, th there's never been such a hyper awareness around local business uh, as there is over the past uh, year and a half with COVID. And so just wanted to thank all of our local leaders and our business owners that are on the call today. And so I would like to get into the next few minutes. We're gonna be, I'm gonna be moderating a panel discussion and I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Sefer uh, Teachout, which is an associate law professor at Fordham University and a leading expert on antitrust and corruption laws. She has written dozens of law review articles, essays, and two books on these issues, including her most recent Break Em Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big Ag, Big Tech, and Big Money. And then we also have uh, Stacy Mitchell, who is co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, Stacy directs the Institute's uh, Independent Business Initiative, and she's done extensive research and writing about Amazon, obviously, monopoly power and the critical importance of small business. And our IBAs really rely on Stacy uh, to educate policymakers on why these issues are so important. And so uh, before we get into the panel, I would just like to remind our participants to submit questions using the Q&A function. And uh, I would like to remind if there's any press on the call to stay on the webinar. 
at the close of the event for a media Q&A uh, with panelists and, and moderators. And so I'll start with uh, Sefer. Hi, well, thank you so much for, oh, did you have a question? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll let you just introduce yourself real quick. And, and, and then, yes, I do have a question for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you to all of you who are incredible um, leaders um, for being here at such an inc incredibly difficult time. Um, I just want to underline something that um, uh, I think we should all take from the, the great introduction by Congressman Cicilline. We are at this absolute crucible moment in this country. Um, there is no, there is bipartisan support for new antitrust laws, taking on uh, big monopolies and doing something. The question is not whether or not Congress will act, it is what it will do. And I ask you, uh, even as you are uh, dealing with incredibly difficult situations, to, to uh, continue to raise your voices because for strong antitrust laws to be passed and we need them to be passed, small business owners being very clear about the ways in which existing monopolies are destroying the possibility of small business and thriving communities is a central part of the political alliance that will allow this to happen. So I'm really uh, honored to be here with uh, such incredible people. And thanks, Suffer, for that message. I mean, that, that goes right into the question. Uh, in your testimony before the Congressman's, uh, Congressman's Committee last fall, you talked about why antitrust is something Congress must tackle. Why does Congress need to act on this issue now? Well, um, I think it's something that is just so basic. It's like one of these big lies that we all have that we have to tear apart, which is the idea that antitrust is done only by the courts and enforcers. We have real issues with making our enforcers do their job. They, there, there are uh, tools that are lying around getting rusty that would make a transformational difference. But at the same time, there is nothing more essential in the, con in the sort of the uh, bailiwick of Congress, the job of Congress, than to uh, provide for the conditions for a thriving economy. And that means standing up to those companies that are choking our businesses and communities and our freedom, by the way, too. We haven't talked about the democratic impacts here. Now, for most of American history, this was obvious. The first antitrust laws in the 19th century, the first federal antitrust laws, came about because companies were playing states against each other. And it was very clear that we needed a federal uh, uh, legislative um, involvement to protect against abusive behavior in the 1900s, in the 1910s, in the 1920s, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were regular hearings and debate about antitrust legislation, about how we should fix it and improve it. Senator Phil Hart, who famously crafted and led, uh, uh, was a, a major leader in the 1965 civil rights law, cared about two things, civil rights, and antitrust and went to his deathbed working on antitrust laws because he knew how important it was to improve our antitrust laws to support small businesses, workers, and democratic freedom. Since the 70s, late 70s in particular, uh, around 1980, um, uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it was led by Reagan, but it's been a bipartisan uh, betrayal, have acted as if antitrust legislation is not their job. Uh, in those 40 years, courts have rewritten existing statutes, misinterpreting them, and making it incredibly difficult to bring, um, uh, bring cases, which in turn has made it really hard for private plaintiffs and for, and for um, enforcers to bring those cases that could actually redistribute some of the um, uh, wealth and power in the society and allow the people who are doing the work to, have, to, to create our communities 
um, actually to get the value there. So we've had 40 years of acting like it's their job. It is Congress's job. And um, I, I got to tell you, this is, even though Republicans and Democrats on the antitrust subcommittee disagree, they did agree on the basic premise that Congress should act here. And so we got to get rid of the lie that it is just for the agency. This is a core congressional um, task. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Sever. That, that was great. And, and Stacy, just to chime in, uh, what do you think are, are the most important steps uh, Congress should be taking? Yeah, well, thank you, Derek. Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, I just, I was really glad to hear Congressman Cicilline say that uh, our, our, our failure to act on this is not an option. And I think that really speaks to the moment we're at. I mean, we look around uh, at the state of the economy that does not work for most people. We look at the huge drop in independent business uh, formation that's been happening, the, the state of our communities, uh, and really the state of our democracy. Um, we have to deal with the issue of concentrated power. And so I was just really glad to hear him say that. And I think he, he's right about it. Um, in terms of what Congress needs to do, I mean, there are a number of legislative reforms that are laid out in his uh, subcommittee's report, and they're all important. But I will, I'll lift up just three of them really quickly. One is that we need to deal with the power of the tech companies, the, these online digital gatekeepers who now have taken control over key channels of distribution. And if you wanna move your goods to market, you have to go through their gates. You have to hand over control of your customers, your data, a, a significant share of your revenue in order to get through those gates. I mean, this is not um, an open market. It's not a fair market. And so we need to deal with that problem directly. Um, the first recommendation in the report was something that they, the report refers to as structural separation. And that essentially means um, uh, that we need to, to split up these dominant platforms so that Amazon is a marketplace online. Uh, Amazon is not both owning the infrastructure that you need to reach the market and competing with you on it. But those two things, that's a fundamental conflict of interest. And we need to address that by, by splitting it apart. Congress has done that before. We did it with the railroads, um, you know, sort of most famously. Um, similarly, we've done it with, with banks. You know, if you're, you're a bank, there are li your limits on your ability to go operate in other industries because you, you lend uh, and you play this fundamental sort of infrastructure role in the economy. And therefore, you can't have a conflict of interest. You have to be a neutral arbiter. So we need to do that with the platforms. And we need to, uh, to, uh, to apply rules of fair dealing, right? So that um, they, they uh, have some rules around uh, how they can operate and how they have to treat the companies and the, and the, and the consumers that depend on their platforms. So that's one. Uh, two, Congress needs to correct a bunch of bad court decisions. You know, the courts, uh, you know, really understand, you know, that this history that, that Zephyr, I think, really helpfully la laid out, you know, the courts have been, were, you know, have for many decades now been just enamored with these economic theories about the, the greatness of, of bigness, of uh, greater efficiencies. Those theories we now just know from lots of evidence and, uh, are, are not actually true, um, but, but enamored with those ideas of greater efficiency. The courts have essentially um, you know, issued a number of decisions through the 80s and 90s um, that allow these uh, dominant companies to bully uh, and, and abuse their uh, smaller rivals. Um, and so instead of actually having to compete head to head, they can simply use their superior size to muscle other companies out of the market. Um, a great example of this is predatory pricing. If you're big, you know, and we can see this with, with Walmart, you come into a, to a community, you sell goods at a loss, other companies, smaller businesses can't do that um, because they don't have that financial backing from Wall Street. Eventually they go out of business and you own the market. We've seen this Amazon do this in one sector after another. But predatory pricing, according to a Supreme Court decision from the, from the 90s, is, doesn't, it doesn't exist and you really can't even prove it. Uh, and they essentially made it made it legal. So the second big thing that Congress needs to do is that they need to step in and and say, when we said that monopolizing markets was a crime, we meant it, um, and that these things are really illegal. And then the, and then the third one um, is that Congress needs to to get the antitrust agencies, especially the Federal Trade Commission, 
uh, to do their job. The Federal Trade Commission's job is to police unfair methods of competition. Um, but they have not been doing that. And they've paid uh, very, uh, you know, they've been really insufficiently concerned about the way big companies uh, abuse their market power against small companies. And the way Congress needs to do that is with, with greater oversight. So those are the three things I would really lift up as key, uh, key pieces. Thank you, Stacy. It's very informative. And I think, so next we will be fielding a couple of questions from business owners. And I think we have first up uh, Peter Rose, who is with the Chelsea Group in Woodhaven, Michigan. Peter? Should probably unmute that. There you go. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, there you are. We can see you now. Well, I mean, I wrote a, I wrote something to as a basis of this thing, but I'll tell you what, in the combination of the commentary of the congressmen and everyone, you guys, you, you people, and the sidebars, there's, there's amazing commentary here. We're dealing with something that's huge. The thing that really um, I wanted, this is not what I wrote, but this is what I'm zeroing in on because antitrust is one thing. But what you're dealing with here is something that was never part of any thinking of earlier lawmakers. We're dealing with panoplies here. Amazon wants to be the everything store. That was that used to be their motto. They they seem to have abandoned that, but they're not kidding. They want to be in everything. So how do you regulate that? How does it make your why isn't there a fear that, for instance, that Amazon web services take care of all of the security agencies of the United States. Doesn't that strike you as being remarkably, <laughs> that's too much power. That's just too much power. So all of these people, Amazon is the one that strikes me the most because it affects me most directly. Because I'm an independent store, I get to talk to people and that's my advantage. I get to actually have conversations with real people. I think there's going to be a, a market for that, but it is shrinking and it's relentless. It's just constant, constant erosion. So uh, I just thought that the, co the concept of um, this panoply thing, which I have never heard used, it's different than, than just plain, you know, BP getting too big. And they're still doing oil. That's what they're doing. They want, so it, it's, it's bad to have that happen. But what happens when somebody wants to do fill dirt and you know, clothes. They want to own everything. So I think that's really, this is very encouraging to me. This whole conversation has been very, very uh, in, in, uh, encouraging. That's the best word. Thank you, well, Stacey. Th th thank you, Peter, for your um, contribution, <laughs> your many contributions. Um, but I, that level of urgency is really important. And I actually came to, and I've been writing and working on anti-monopoly law for several years now, but I came to it because of fears about our democracy, that we are talking about a scope of power that you all understand is governing power. It's trying to govern, not be part of an open competitive marketplace. And up until the 1970s, Everybody in America understood that. They might disagree about particular laws, but they understood that antitrust law was essential for democracy protection. So what we can do about Amazon is because more and more people are suddenly seeing and experiencing that power is one, break up the component parts. You can't, you don't get to be three things because that really means you're replacing government in these ways. And somebody was asking about, um, I mean, just think of one example about the, the overturning laws that Stacy's talking about. Amazon can tell you, oh, you don't have to use our shipping service, but if you do, you get better treatment on our platform. So everybody understands what that means. You don't have to. <laughs> well, under prior law, it would be very clear to enforcers that they would win that case. And I actually think enforcers should bring that case anyway. I think it's a pretty clear case of Amazon violating the law. But we should overturn any ambiguity around that to say if you are going to, in a dominant position, tie one service to another, you can't do that. 
So breaking up having per se rules instead of rules where courts have to decide if there's a business justification, these can have massive you know, transformative impacts on our economy. And uh, Hal Singer, an economist, just wrote recently, and it's a very powerful case, is this is, you know, we have such radical inequality and such radical regional inequality. Antitrust, changing our antitrust laws and enforcing existing antitrust is a major part of actually having more equality uh, throughout our society. <laughs> I totally agree with that. And Peter, thanks so much for your question. Um, you know, I, I will only just add that I, th I think that part of what you're getting at is the ability of Amazon in particular to use the incredible amount of data and the surveillance that it, it has. You know, I mean, if you are the marketplace through which over 50% of all online transactions happen, if you are AWS and you control the infrastructure that an enormous number of companies and governments rely on to manage their data, if you're Alexa, you're the dominant voice interface in between people accessing the internet, accessing their other devices in their homes, um, if you're the primary shipping platform, if you're running POS systems for a lot of businesses, if you're now the lender for third parties, so on and on, what you've effectively constructed is a godlike view of so much of what is happening in the economy. And this explains a lot of how Amazon is able to see um, you know, what's happening in different market segments and use that data and that advantage to move into those uh, sectors with a built-in advantage that no one else has. Everybody else is flying blind. Amazon has all of the, all of the data and information. And again, this I think comes back to the centrality of why um, the structural separation or the breakup piece of these solutions is so important because if you sever Amazon into multiple businesses, it can't use the information it gets in one sector to advantage itself in another, which is a lot of how we see it, it using its power. So I think the role of data is one of the things that has changed and has really um, sort of amplified uh, concerns that were already there into sort of another, uh, another dimension. I also want to say, because I just think it's so important, and I think this kind of underscores your question too, is that there really is, you know, the support for doing this. Um, I mean, if you had said five years ago, we're going to be on track to be talking about legislation to maybe break up some of the big tech companies, it would have sounded completely far-fetched. Um, but it's not, you know, we, we just had, I just saw a poll out today that shows that, um, you know, Americans have really moved on this issue uh, and something like 60% now support uh, strong regulation around uh, big tech in particular. And so um, there's been a lot of shift in, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Americans are really connecting the dots on this issue. Um, and that there are a lot of people, you know, whether it's, it's unions and working organizations, civil rights groups, uh, independent business groups, others who are really speaking up uh, on this issue in, in an incredible way. So thank you so much for your question and for everything you do uh, in Wyandotte. Thank you, Peter. And we have our next business owner, Teresa Stickler, who is with Melrose Pharmacy in Phoenix, Arizona. Teresa? Hi, I'm an independent pharmacy owner Pharmacy benefit managers, also known as PBMs, such as Express Scripts, Optum, and CVS Caremark Aetna now, are operating unregulated without checks, balances, and oversight from government. These three companies control the insurance plan, the negotiations, the formularies, and the plan administration of over three quarters of the market. They contract their preferred provider network pharmacies including their own retail and mail order pharmacies. Pharmacies are forced into take it or leave it contracts that pay sometimes below our acquisition costs. It's a situation where we contract with our competition. This business model is one of the main factors in the skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs, but also has detrimental effects on employers, payers, local, state, and federal governments taxpayers and patients, as well as causing the mass disappearance of local independent community pharmacies. Why don't the antitrust agencies see this? Oh, Teresa, thank you. That's such a great, important question. And, and it has become so magnified by, you know, what's happening with the vaccine. I mean, independent pharmacies in the places where they've been allowed 
to do vaccinations are you know, leading the way and doing this you know, much more effectively in terms of reaching uh, nursing homes in January and, and long-term care facilities um, than we, you know, CVS and Walgreens completely dropped the ball and failed in so many different ways, even though they had been favored by government to do that. You know, your question is so important, and it speaks to something that a lot of independent businesses in different sectors experience. So this idea that independent pharmacies are dependent on their biggest competitors for what they're going to be reimbursed when they fill a prescription. So CVS is the top one, right? You know, like CVS owns major health insurer, the largest retail pharmacy, and is the largest PBM, um, meaning that it, it controls reimbursement rates for independent pharmacies and for, for other pharmacies. I mean, if you explain that, as I have done to just any, you know, anybody, uh, someone you meet in a bar or whatever, um, they immediately are like, well, that can't be. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. That's obviously a huge conflict of interest. And but we see this all across the economy. Um, we see, for example, Anheuser Busch, you know, they have these relationships with big distributors where um, they can, in some states, they can keep independent craft beers from getting shelf space in the supermarkets. They put their own craft label beer up there instead. I mean, they can basically just cut off uh, access. Um, this is, you know, it's essentially, it's, it's referred to as like vertical integration, uh, sort of in the antitrust world. And it, it really speaks to how agencies like the Federal Trade Commission have been so um, kind of drunk the Kool-Aid about this uh, sort of bigger is better stuff that they can't see clearly what any, any common sense, per they've lost their sense of common sense, right? They can't see clearly what anyone can see as a market problem. Um, so this issue is getting more attention. It's getting more attention in Congress. In fact, I think the House last year did pass a study bill around looking at this problem. And so we are beginning to see different voices speaking up. Um, and I think the vaccine rollout has really also woken a lot of people up to this problem. Uh, and the implications, of course, aren't just independent pharmacies, but as you noted, it's the communities that they serve. Uh, disproportionately rural areas, disproportionately uh, black and brown communities too, who are losing, you know, having no pharmacy service at all because of, of the role of CVS and, and driving independent pharmacies out. So I am encouraged by um, the, the new attention. And I, I also am, am hoping that we'll see President Biden appoint uh, FTC commissioners who get these kinds of issues. We're still waiting to see, you know, there's there's going to, there are two empty slots, who's, who's going to slot in there, um, and that's going to be a really critical uh, thing to be looking for. Are we going to see people understand how markets work? And thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, one of the, this just points to when we are looking at the new legislation, um, it's there's a few things that are critical. One is that oh, the legislation will lead to breakups, not just further behavioral regulation, because when you have conflicts of interest, those conflicts of interest will be abused. And the new legislation should put as core values, not just consumer price. By the way, Courts are really bad at figuring out what kind of mergers are actually going to be good for consumers anyway, but the dispersion of power and opposing systems that allow conflicts of interest. And those are core values that we should embed in the new legislation. And I think also to your point, there's a question about like, should I focus on enforcement or do I focus on the new laws? And the answer is both. And they actually build off of each other because when there is new enforcement, it gives energy to new laws. And we've seen this with the, with the Facebook and Google lawsuits. And when there are new laws, it gives strength to enforcers who don't then bring this 40 years of learned helplessness uh, to their jobs. Well, thank you all. And, and, and Suffer, I know you have a hard stop, but I'll, I'll try a rapid fire question. Um, and we had a bunch that uh, questions from businesses that sell on Amazon's marketplace as third party sellers and the problems they face. Uh, one seller, Doug Medirza, talked about how Amazon seized his inventory, but he can't take legal action to get it back. That's because Amazon required him to waive his right to go to court when he signed up. Uh, so instead, he has to go to arbitration. 
And another seller, Jason Boyce, uh, asked, when will Amazon give Amazon sellers to which Amazon owes so much a voice where they can express their very real concerns, damaging their businesses and, and expect honest answers? Rapid fire answers. <laughs> These are such <laughs> deep, there's just such deep pathologies. Like um, uh, one is that there is a, a, a bill in Congress which passed last year and is on the verge or is getting passed now, um, banning this kind of arbitration, which is absolutely essential. And it's important to put pressure on the Senate to push that through because one of the uh, real tragedies of arbitration is one, you can't get lawyers to bring your case. And second, these stories aren't told and these stories being told are essential. So, we, so part of the monopoly problem is the arbitration problem. And, um, oh, I forget what the second question is, but um, uh, that bill is called the FAIR Act, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I do have to go teach corporate law. So I'm going to run, but uh, thank, uh, thank you for your um, questions. And, and uh, um, we will all be working together to really transform our society. Thanks, Zephyr. Thanks, Zephyr. All right, well, we're at 2.11. And so now I think it's time to turn it over to Dana Aness, who is with Stay Local New Orleans. I've had the pleasure of serving with Dana on the board of the American Independent Business Alliance. I think I met her uh, five years ago or so out in Bozeman, Montana, it was a while ago, so. Uh, thanks, of Dana. I'll places. turn it over to you. <laughs> thanks, Derek. And thank you all for attending today's webinar. As we, we've been reminded today, uh, time and time again, fair markets and antitrust reform are vital to building strong and resilient local economies. We invite you to sign up now to fight for fair markets and against monopoly power. Yes, there is something we can all do. Uh, follow the link in the chat to stay informed and take action. It is going to take all of us working together to make sure that the issues we talked about today are addressed. And that link I mentioned will take you to our action site where you can decide how you want to fight monopoly power. Thank you again to our moderators, Dan Cullen from the ABA, Derek Peebles from Amoeba, to Congressman Cicilline, our panel, and to our small business owners for this wonderful conversation. Thank you all for joining in. Please remember to follow that link in the chat to stay informed.